Today, we are welcomed on the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast by my dear brother, Ato Chris Dodge, a.k.a. Habta Selassie. How are you doing, Habta Selassie? Hey, what's up, Nika Hanak? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. We're going to talk to you all a little bit in a form of introducing something that really are conversations we've had over a number of years. Our brother Chris is a, a historian and a middle school teacher has been in the K-12 system as an educator for a number of years. But like me, you know, we're classically trained in academia for a certain field. But a lot of the stuff that you may hear us talking about is just we were passionate about and went uh, you know, on our own to to try to find out a little bit more. So we want to talk about Sabbatarians, who are people who like the Seventh Day Adventist, except instead of the American Protestant scene and the Ethiopian Orthodox scene, we're focused on worshiping not only on Sundays, but in addition to. So that's probably another distinction between them and the Seventh Day Adventist. It's not like only on Saturday, which is the original Sabbath. But also on or the Sabbath of Christians Sunday and a group known as the Stephanites who are followers of someone named of Father Stephen or Father Stephen. And of course, his foil, Emperor Zerayakwa, not to be confused with the great philosopher Zerayakwa, who will come about a century after him. The emperor is in the 1400s, so is Father Stephen. I think some of the Sabbath stuff begins in the 1300s and, and gets to the 1400s. We might be off on some of the dates. Y'all could fact check us later. And then we can get into some of the These are the names of various informal fractures that have happened in the church. But, you know, even to this day in 2020, we're dealing with some of it. And it began centuries ago. So, Chris, whether it's some of the direct, I think, theological or Christological controversies or whether it's the Sabbath or whether it's the Stephanites, we can start off anywhere you want to start. You know, just an introduction. My name's Chris. Some of you know me as Otto Chris. I've been working with the Ethiopian Church for uh, 16 years now, and I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of our community and just kind of share my voice and things I've learned. As Deacon Hanok, my brother, uh, introduced, you know, we're not exactly the most experts on these subjects, but we have our own expertise. And so I just wanted people to know that this is just a conversation we're having. You know, myself and Deacon Hanok don't claim to be the expert on everything we discuss. Me personally, I just collect what I call great notes, and I like to share my notebook with people. And, and the way you learn and collect notes is by listening to those who might know more about something than yourself. So please, if there's folks in the audience that, that have an expertise on something or we make a mistake, please at me at Chris Hoppe Selassie or at Deacon Hanock, and we'd love to continue the dialogue and discussion because that's how I can add more to my notebook to be able to share with other people. So really, I think the topic of our discussion today, and it builds on conversations my brother Deacon and I have had over the past, is this kind of idea of the evolution of the Ethiopian church. So we can view it through these three main schisms that he discussed, the Sabbatarians, the Stephanites, and this Kibat Sos Ledet. Uh, Twahedo uh, debate, and really it touches into the wider context of Ethiopian history as a whole to kind of just answer the basic question of the things that we do in the Ethiopian church today, where did they come from, and why do we do them? And in my experience working with Sunday school for the past uh, decade or so, is that people have a lot of questions, and our pedagogy in the Ethiopian church has always not been to answer them to people's satisfaction. So the deacon and I hope that our conversation can really bring more answers and definitely more questions for people to understand why we do things the way we do, what does each thing mean, and why is it important to do it this way? Because really orthodox means, you know, the straight or correct teaching. And by default, to know the correct teaching, you got to know the wrong teaching and compare and contrast them. So really looking at these three uh, mistakes of history allow us to understand the corrections that the church made and to institute doing things the correct way. And so I think, you know, historian bias is great to go chronologically, and they're all really interconnected. So the connections will stand out if we just start with Awostaros uh, and the Sabbatarians and the Solomonic Restoration as a context that leads us to the Stephanites and this kind of golden age of the Solomonic Restoration. And then more modern times in the 19th century, and as the deacon mentioned, you know, even today with the idea of Kabat uh, and uh, Segalej, the son of grace, 
and Sosla dead. And in Orthodox history, they're not new uh, heresies. They're called unctionists and adoptionists. So we're touching on things that have happened in the past. Funny thing about heresies, they just keep coming back and forth, and the same wrong ideas just kind of recirculate across history. But again, that's good for us because it allows us to learn from the past so we can get a deeper understanding and really also understand the connection that real life and real people have with these bigger things about church and religion and ultimately our relationship with God. So, you know, from an Orthodox Christian, we know we learn about God through the saints and through the example of the people in the history of the church. And so from a historical perspective, their biography and their life, what they think, what they experience will ultimately help us have a better understanding of our experiences today. And since we're Orthodox Christians, hopefully we can get an idea how that explains what we do in the church. That's right. So let's start with uh, Eustatios. This is probably the of the three that I've I've read the the least about, but um, somewhat familiar. So I'll give the briefest of introductions and and let you take over there a little bit. You know the the basic understanding. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> oh, the basic understanding is an issue that a couple centuries later. Emperor Gladius or Claudius of Ethiopia runs into. And it, it's really when the Jesuits come later that some of these things are resolved in writing. And at the earlier stages, they're resolved in the understanding of the Ethiopian community. Uh, if not, you know, the entirety, the few elites who are properly trained in Tribuame and Mizaiftbet, which is the Aksumite school of interpretation and of scriptures. And, and maybe, you know, the lack of popularization of the wisdom that's there led to some more room for what our beloved father Thomas Finley talks about as faith by folklore. And if you think that faith by folklore is playing a game of a children's game of telephone over a few centuries, you can see how some of these heresies or some of this apostasy happens. But Eustatios is basically with a faction of people. It's not clear to me when this actually begins, particularly with some of the claims of the Solomonic dynasty and others of this long ranging Judaism in Ethiopia. Uh, also, we have people of Syrian background who are often immigrating to Ethiopia. And we know that there were Syrian Jews who, who may have, you know, practiced in this way too. So anyway, there's a, there's a lot of intrigue, there's a lot of mystery, and there's a lot of emotions that are attached. So as, as much as possible, although Otto, Chris, and I have, have laid before you some of our, our biases as being, you know, members of the church, we, we try to look at history as detached as possible, as, as a historian would. So in any event, at, at some point, in time, but we're especially focusing in periods between the 1200s to the 1600s and later on to the 1800s, you have these group of Ethiopian Orthodox Christians who, in addition to worshiping on Sundays, worship on Saturdays. And it's not just like, oh, let's randomly do it, but it's done religiously, pun intended, in this manner, because you know it is, it is a religious matter that is being done. And I think the basic idea behind it might be weird for 21st century Americans who might think, oh, Saturdays are picnic day. Saturdays are day for bowling or Saturdays, you know, the day we go to our ice skating rink or this, that, and the third. But the idea of the liturgy as uh, talks about in the, you know, the dissertation of Father Mabratu Kiros Gavru from Toronto, Mariam, is that we are trying to access this time that is like no time at all. We're trying to be in this space where we are linking up with our brethren and sistren in the church triumphant and the church that is beyond, not just the human beings who have fallen asleep with the Lord, but the angels, the divine council, the four heavenly creatures, the 24 presbyters. And we're trying to enter this space of, of eternal worship so the idea that God is trapped into one day at one time is foreign to us. And so I think Eustatios and his followers just had the idea, if you have time to breathe, you know, if God is providing you with shelter, with food, with clothing, with all of these provisions, 
why not have another day of good nasi? Why not have another day of thanks? So that that's my thoughts on it. Chris, what, what's your take on Mustatios and his followers choosing Saturday in addition to Sunday? So I like minds think I like, you know, I'm glad you touched on the Solomonic kind of meta narrative because it's in my own notes of really what frames all this. And so, and also the idea of transmitting history and they're really interconnected, the idea of the Solomonic meta narrative. I use that term because it's this kind of permeating mythology that's part of almost everything in Ethiopian polity, culture, religion, and whether people who agree or disagree with it, it influences, you know, believers and, and, and opposition alike. And it's a driving force. And today, you'd be hard pressed to find an Ethiopian who's truly critical of the idea. But, you know, it's become that much of the fabric of what it means to be Habasha, to have this Solomonic meta narrative, this, this def definition of this kind of Hebraic history and ancestry. And, you know, whether it's factually correct or not, whether it's actually history, we can always debate. But from a historian's perspective, there's some gravity to it. You know, the myths that we believe are as important as the facts that happen. You know, today in America, 4th of July coming up, there's a lot of mythology about our country and our history here in the U.S. And when you're a historian, a lot of it's not true. But what people believe still drives their feelings and their ideas and what they do even today, whether it's correct or not. So whether the Ethiopian emperors were actually descended from King Solomon and King David, who themselves may not have historically existed or not, which is a separate conversation. I know people just got mad when I said that. They could at me, Chris Hafez will talk about it. So whether those people even exist or not can be debated. But the belief in their existence influenced so much of world history that we teach it from a secular way about King David and Judaism. And so whether King Solomon had a son in Ethiopia is irrelevant to that for so long, many Ethiopians believe that. And it really comes from this Solomonic restoration in 1270, which coincides with the, the monk uh, Wostara Wos. And so the Sabbatarian controversy happens in this revival of the Ethiopian empire of sorts and this kind of really medieval high point. And so also in regards to history, one of the downsides of Ethiopian history is, uh, is it's hard to find all the evidence of a lot of these things because most of the archeological places are continuously inhabited, right? And archeologists are essentially glorified trash diggers. They love to find human trash because it tells us so much about the day-to-day -day life and what people believe in, what they value, what they don't value. So a lot of what archaeologists find come from trash and come from grave sites. Well, in a continuously inhabited zone, people don't save their trash, right? It's trash. It's out thrown out for a reason. So unfortunately, there's not as much kind of Western um, metho me methodology accepted history. And the oral traditions are still important. You know, that the people tell these stories and believe them generation after generation, even if they embellish a little bit reflects some deeper truth, right? Joseph Campbell says that mythology always reflects a deeper truth, sometimes a deeper truth we can't necessarily say in history. So as the, this priest, uh, Wostado Wos, comes in that period, right? His prestige is from a monastery that had a lot of influence over the emperor, Yukuna Amlak, who has credited as the Solomonic Restoration. And they called a restoration because of the Zagwe dynasty that preceded it, the, the Agwe people, who were from a different part of Ethiopia than the Aksumite time. And so it's really a period of revival for people who call themselves Habasha in their history and this idea of reviving this great Aksumite glory as well. And we should understand it comes in the context in world, cult world history of the Crusades and similar revivals across the Levant and in Europe. You know, there's a lot of religious zeal going on in that time. So to keep it going, Awostara was believed in worshiping on the Sabbath, on Saturdays, and on Sundays. Now, why it's important and why it's an issue is at the same time in the uh, 13th century, there were Judaizers in the Coptic Church in Alexandria who were trying to take away Sunday worship. And so the Alexandrians were very sensitive about Saturday worship because they mistook it as Judaizers. So you see canons across the Egyptian church forbidding Jewish practices, worshiping on Jewish holidays, you know, practicing the Jewish law and kosher diet and fellowshipping with Jewish people. It became a kind of rivalry. And we see the same thing happen in Europe a little bit later. And so part of the crackdown, if you will, during the Solomonic Restoration is the response from the, the messaging from the Coptic Patriarch in Alexandria saying, hey, here's the new canons, here's the new books you need to read. And they're saying no Saturday worship. Meanwhile, that was something that probably had existed in Ethiopia without issue until this canon comes down around the same time. And so people are rightfully upset, and it becomes a long-standing debate. Indeed, uh, Awostaros, I believe, had to go into exile 
And I believe his remains are found in a monastery in present-day Armenia because he spent some time in Jerusalem and Armenia because of the backlash he received for wanting to continue to press for a Saturday worship. And indeed, touching what we get a little later with, with uh, Emperor Zadiakov at a council he led as a kind of consolation and reconciliation allowed formally for Saturday worship, too. So we'll come back in a little bit when we talk about the Stephanites and Zadiakov, the kind of resolution of this issue. But it really was that not only idea about worshiping on Saturday, but Judaizing as a whole. And by no coincidence, we're in the Solomonic Restoration where Ethiopians are really pushing their Judaic history and this idea of coming from a, he a Hebrew culture and history and people. So you can see the backlash that might be happening in this weird kind of back and forth where the hierarchy of the larger church in Alexandria is sending this messaging to Ethiopia about Judaizing at the same time with the Solomonic Restoration or the Ethiopian political system and culture is embracing this idea of a Jewish influence in history. So it's no small thing. It's really formative for the Ethiopian church and Ethiopian culture as a whole. Yeah, and for those who don't know, in case there are some real newcomers, just to zoom out a little bit on some of the points Atokuris is making, the divine right of kings as interpreted by the Solomonic dynasty is that they trace their lineage all the way back to King David, who is in the line of the Israelite kings. So that if there was a divine right to David and Saul, then that there would be some validation of Solomon, of Solomon's child, Minelik I, through the Queen of Sheba, whom the Yemenites and other South Arabians duel it out with sometimes online with the Ethiopians of, of where Makda or Queen Sheba was from. That's one point to be had. Another point, this idea of Judaizing, right? So there's a claim to the divine right of kings through Jewish blood of the royalty that is claimed. In addition, you have circumcision often happening before baptism. You have Nothing in the culture of pork. So whether it's do the, they even have uh, pigs in Ethiopia? <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, now they do for sure. Uh, but historically, I don't think so. You know, we don't we don't have like. I mean, we have the word, so it must have been there. You know, usually you don't have a word for something that's not there. But you know, maybe it was a boar more than a domesticated pig, and uh, you no, know. Even, yeah. <laughs> one, one of the words for evil in Gandus Yarid, who's around the 500s, um, one of his hymnals, it opens by saying, Yisum ein, Yisum lesan, Znani Yisum, Msamia Hasum. So he says, May the eye fast, may the tongue or the language, the speech fast, may the ears fast from hearing evil. But the word for evil is swinery. He says, mm. may, may you, may the tongue and all these things, may, may your, I like the, like the three monkeys that say, see no evil, do not like hear no evil, speak no evil, but in relation to swinery. So see no swinery, taste no swinery, hear no swinery. And, and, you know, that's how he begins his, his hymnal. So it makes me think it was there, but we have, you know, the national dish of Ethiopia now is uh, spicy chicken stew. We have mm -hmm. so many beef dishes but we don't have any organic pork dishes. And we have several cultures within Ethiopia that each kind of have their own cuisine that over the centuries and millennia have blended together. None of them, to my knowledge, have an organic, you know, swine on, on their menu. So, so anyway, that, that, that's part of it too. And the way even they observe the Sabbath, not just by having a liturgy on Saturdays, but really I knew people in the 20th century who wouldn't wash their clothes. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I know people just a few years ago they would not do laundry on Saturdays. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't eat hot food. They would have their leftover uh, stews and whatever other types of, you know, porridges, and they would just eat them cold. So th that's, that's this whole uh, idea of Judaism, which is, you know, similar, but maybe less forceful than the Jerusalemite community that was led by the brother of our Lord, uh, the Bishop James, who's, you know, author of, the book of James or the scroll of James or of Jacob in, in the New Testament. So to Brother Chris's point, uh, 
that's all, all this is going on. And it leads to something. I think there's another interesting point. The Copts, the church of Alexandria was managing the church in Ethiopia for centuries from the three hundreds till this period we're talking about from the 1270s onwards. And it doesn't stop till his uh, Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie, around the 40s, the 1940s or 50s. And he, he grants something called autocephaly to the church. It's important to see what the role of savvy king could do for Ethiopia, because going back to Emperor Zerayagob, he's not the patriarch. Some Egyptian person is the patriarch. But there's a lot of miscommunication. There are a lot of these weird episodes in history where we might be missing a bishop, where they might send a Muslim instead of sending an Orthodox Christian to be the bishop. There's a lot of weird stuff that happens. And it's not clear that there were a lot of strong ties. We didn't have the level of, you know, digital communication where Chris and I are able to communicate across, you know, we're not in the same house right now, but we're able to have a clear picture and, and we're speaking the same language, all of these things. It's not clear to me how culturally competent these Egyptian you know, overseers were over the time. And so throughout that time, like you said, they're dealing with their own separate issue in Alexandria and the surrounding regions in Egypt, while Ethiopia is kind of a vassal church. But one thing I always say when I talk about this church is that, you know, in belief, we've always been Orthodox. But I think structurally, we have been very Protestant in, in terms of the, the chaos of how things have been run and so various sects have come up. One of the things I thank God about constantly is that they never got enough of a strong foothold to have any giant formal schisms in Ethiopia over a long, long history. But yeah, so it's- No, they, they, they kind of were. I mean, you touch on the heart of the real issue of why there's an evolution in praxis to begin with, which is, you know, and this is across world history. This is in European Christianity. This is in Middle Eastern Levantine Christianity, you know, and Eastern Orthodox and Russia. The idea that, you know, things are the same for this long period of time is just simply not true because there wasn't a formal means of communication and books are expensive until the 1500s. And that's part of a large part of why we see this evolution in the 14, 15, 1600s of kind of uh, systematizing belief and creating more universal structures. At the end of the day, you know, for the first thousand years of the Ethiopian church, as you said, they just had this titular head who was the metropolitan sent from Alexandria. And it was not a prestigious post, quite the opposite. They didn't usually send the best person because it wasn't the best job. And frankly, the Ethiopians had a tradition of doing things their own way under the Itchige anyways. And so the bishop who came there was really just there to ordain people. I mean, I, I, it was that simple. The purpose of the metropolitan sent from Egypt who didn't speak generally the languages and had to go through layers of interpreters was given an important form, uh, uh, symbolic role, no doubt, in Ethiopia. And his, he was necessary there to legitimize the churches, but his really had one job and it was not typified by mass ordination, you know, on a holiday ordaining hundreds of people at a time and then them doing their own work. So the reason there's not this kind of systematic structure of Christianity across Ethiopia, there's, I like to use Protestant, but we got to be careful because folks get the wrong idea what we mean by that. I think you just mean a lack of kind of universalism. Things are a little different in different regions and reflecting different cultures and ideas. It's precisely because the only thing that made you orthodox for a long time was the apostolic succession of the priest or bishop you served under. And they were given so much leeway by the sheer reality of the lack of technology, specifically communication really centralized ideas. You know, when we tap into uh, this golden age under Emperor Zayacob or later the philosopher and, you know, the famous, famous scribe uh, uh, Georgis who really put together so much of the source material we have, you know, there's a reason that we see this kind of sophistication of the Ethiopian church in that time because the technology is there to start to distribute centralized information to really start to get things to be on the same page. In fact, that's really the heart of what Emperor Zarayakov's whole thing was, was he was really creating a system of worship in the church to make things unified. He got a lot of slack for it across the empire because people were used to doing things their own way. And it was very different to suddenly have this universal structure. And it's because of that lack of, of, of technology that kept people together.
and basically the purpose of the priest, uh, the bishop, was to just ordain the priest and, and do the day-to-day -day religion kind of on the fly. And, you know, even having a full Bible might be a big deal for some parishes, let alone the kind of sophisticated library that people today have, that we have as PDF files on our smartphone. And again, that's not unique to Ethiopia. That's across the world. You know, I, I definitely don't want to have a Eurocentric idea that somehow Ethiopia was backwards at that time. You know, that was world history up until the 1400s, 1500s. And that's why we see this true renaissance around the world of culture and technology, because there's a means to keep it together and share ideas. And humans love new ideas. And once we get a new one, we build on that one. And, you know, we, we, the pattern set. And, you know, just to kind of sum up what, since we've already kind of moved on, just to finish up with the Sabbatarians, they do, you know, what I think they... I think what they symbolize is the Solomonic restoration. You know, we look at them in the past as a heresy, but the church doesn't recognize them that way. You know, why Osadawos had to go into exile, he's finally remembered in the Synaxarium as a saint, as a blessed father, indeed in Alexandria and Armenia. And so I don't think that in his lifetime, he was necessarily a bad figure. And I think that he's called today in a context just so we can clarify the difference. But ultimately, his successors in the monastery, I think with him, he's more famous for the seven or eight monks who succeeded him, who have a name for themselves in Ethiopia. They really kept the Sabbatarian idea alive and the Solomonic Restoration, this really um, Old Testament character and flavor to Ethiopian worship. And, you know, at this time when the Coptic Church is pushing against Judaizing, the Ethiopian church and polity with the Solomonic restoration are going in a very different direction, have that freedom, partly from geography, to be able to do their own thing and really still push this kind of, uh, I'd prefer to say Old Testament than Jewish, because, you know, we can debate the, the, the ethnicity of it. By calling it Jewish, we're kind of attaching an ethnic thing to it. I think calling it Old Testament keeps it open to its source material at the very least Old Testament in the Bible and that kind of flavor and culture. And not to mention that so many Semitic cultural things like pork, that's not just Ethiopia. Semitic cultures in Somalia and Kenya and Uganda also have taboos about pork and, and, and shellfish and things that we call kosher. It's not because they read the Old Testament. It's that because some of those Old Testament ideas have their origin much deeper. I mean, even Paul says circumcision didn't come from Moses, but from the fathers, as in before Moses' law, before Abraham, they were doing that too. So some of it is, you know, codifying Semitic culture as a whole. And those influences are going to be more important in the books that have to redefine themselves in relation to it. But, you know, uh, Wastadawos pushes that, that Jewish and, and Old Testament character to the Ethiopian church. And it's funny, I'm talking with folks today about the Gerd Dam. And, you know, this is connected with that. So he the was Grand alive. Ethiopian, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, for those who don't know the acronym. That's the one. And, you know, um, Wastadawos was a contemporary of the emperor Amtasayan who was a part of that, uh, uh, this kind of culture of damming the Nile and this tension between Egypt. So there was a famine during um, the 1300s that caused the, uh, a drought, I should say, that caused a famine that caused the Nile floods to not be as high as usual. And the Mamluks who ruled Egypt kind of had the suspicion that the Ethiopian emperors had been, had been damming the river and it's not necessarily technologically possible nowadays. There's some historians that kind of debate, and there's some historical record from um, the, the Scottish explorer James Bruce and a couple other sources that there may have been something to that to those stories. But anyways, this idea of damming the Nile and the Egyptians and Ethiopians' control of the river is not new to 2020, even though it's renewed now. The fact that Ethiopians really were able to build that dam that's always been threatened. But you know, there was a period of persecution. Uh, in Egypt, and churches were closed, and the emperor on the Zion threatened to uh, dam the Nile and march on Mecca and destroy the Kaaba, and the Egyptians took his threat seriously because they opened the churches. They allowed Patriarch uh, Pope Benjamin II to, to be, have his authority again. Uh, that is a contemporary of, of Wastadawos and that Solomonic Restoration as well. So it has these bigger contexts, even things happen today, um, and, and both politics and our religion. But again, it's really resolved and, and restored in a way uh, under Emperor Zadi Jacob trying to deal with the issue of the Stephanites with the uh, Council of Mitmach, where they allow for Saturday and Sunday worship 
and had to convince, I believe Emperor Zayekov had two Egyptian metropolitans that were there at the time. And they were um, apparently more scholarly. They, they were people taking their job a little more serious. And I, I understand at that council, there was a dialogue between the Ethiopian hierarchy and clergy and the Egyptian metropolitans. And they convinced them to allow for this, you know, regional autonomy, so to speak, and allow for the Ethiopians to have Saturday worship. And I think that also legitimizes the Solomonic character of the Ethiopian church and culture as well. So at a time when it was the crucible of that restoration, when the outside influences might be pushing away from it, the Ethiopians were allowed to thrive and really build and grow in it. And so why uh, in his lifetime, Lestatowos had some controversy and had to leave. Ultimately, he is a positive figure in the church. So it's not fair to call it a heresy, but certainly it was a controversy. Yeah, it was it was something polemical about the the behavior. So this is a good segue, right? Because the 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 main question is how can you remain orthodox or how can I say this? How diverse or how much diversity and inclusion is allowed within orthodoxy? So you have the basic dogmas of the church and the idea is that outside of these basic few dogmas that a plurality of practice is going to happen. For some contemporary examples, in the Ethiopian churches, you are not supposed to have your shoes on, especially not in the Holy of Holies, the main sanctuary where the priest is blessing the bread and the wine into uh, making it his flesh and his blood, right, of, of, of Christ. In the Syriac tradition, which we are in full communion with, they wear these special shoes that they call the gospel of peace shoes. And you have to wear those shoes when you're in the Holy of Holies. When you're an Ethiopian and you receive the blood, you must cover your mouth. When you are a Copt, again, within our communion, and you receive the blood, and again, overseers for centuries before we get our autocephaly or self-rule, you are not allowed to cover your mouth. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have these contradictory or at least diametrically different practices and you had a good point earlier in saying like what are the things that make us apostolic and orthodox and what is allowed in a plethora of practice and so we see the general swing of emperor zarayako is to say hey egypt we're equally orthodox with you allow us this local practice and by local here it's a national purview so segue into Abba Stephanos, or Father Stephen, who is he? He's a monk. He's a monk dedicated to a sacramental lifestyle. He's a monk who's not just a monk, but an abbot, which means he runs a monastery. After a while, he actually ends up running several monasteries. And at the time, like you're saying, it's a little bit of the Wild West. So each of the monasteries has their own rules of practice. In the Roman Catholic Church, it's as if you have the orders, the, the Jesuits, the Dominicans, the Benedictine, they all have their own forms. They might not have necessarily any names. The followers of, of, of Eustatios, you know, are called Eustatios, you know, sometimes they have the guy's name. Um, the followers of Stephen are called the Castifanos, the little ones of Stephen. So sometimes you'll have some names like this, but, uh, you know, Outside of the original monasteries they were at, it's not that different. An interesting thing is that throughout his life, he is, you know, persecuted. I mean, really, there's no neutral way of saying it by the emperor for not prostrating. Now, the historical question is, is it not prostrating to the emperor or is it not prostrating to icons of Mary and icons of the angels and other icons and I think we hear different historical accounts. Uh, Professor Getacho Haile, one of the leading scholars, he has a, a, an article on JSTOR called The Cause of the, the Stephanites. But then he also has a book, in a, that's in English, he has a book in Amharic where he translates several of the hagiographies from both points of view, from the point of view of Emperor Zarayagob and from the point of view of Stephen and his followers. And that might be one way that we look at it. But any way you cut it, there's a number of things that are different about several monasteries. And 
Father Stephen ran a certain tight shift at his own monasteries, and he was gaining flock. So while Emperor Zedayakob wanted there to be a distinction or an economia, an, an inclusion of diversity of practice between Egypt and Ethiopia, within his jurisdiction of Ethiopia, he wanted a more standardization. And he introduced positive things. He, he introduced, you know, the cross on a, a, a typical Ethiopian garb, like what Brother Chris is wearing or what I might wear on another day. Uh, he instituted monthly holidays and things like that. But yeah, Chris, you want to jump in on the point of standardization? That's really a great hallmark. I mean, uh, th there's, as in all political leadership, you know, there's things to celebrate and there's certainly things to very vehemently criticize. You know, we just, we're, we're here in the U.S. under a president that, that rightfully has a lot of criticism. And we just got over a president that previously got a lot of praise, also rightfully for some things, but didn't receive enough criticism for others, perhaps because of the romanticism of the praise. And so, you know, as in all political things, there's always two sides and there's a little bit of both, right? There's certainly positives and negatives. And that's sort of how all things a matter of power are going to be. So with Emperor Zayekov, there's some very uh, negative things for sure that, that warrant deep reflection and criticism. And there's some things that require great celebration. And I think for historians are great to stay in the middle. People with their emotions are going to swing one way or the other. You could be very romantic in your view of Zadie Jacob and forget all the bad things. You could be very, very critical and forget about the good things. And to kind of detach your emotions and just think about what history is there allows you to kind of stride that middle. I think Zadie Jacob is, is the heart of the conversation we're having, which is during his reign is really that kind of centralization of worship in the Ethiopian church. So point blank, some of the things that we're familiar with today in 2020 in the Ethiopian church have their origin and heart during his reign. And it's no small coincidence that, you know, he was a monk priest before becoming emperor. So his passion was really about worship, but he was also a very strong handed emperor about those things and trying to kind of centralize worship. And, so I think it's important to frame, since we just talked about the Sabbatarians and this kind of revival during Ethiopian both culture and religion at that time, to really talk about what the Ethiopian church was in the 1300s. And so if we look at the records that we have and the archaeology that we have, simple things, for example, let's talk about iconography. That's a big part of Emperor Zayek of uh, time. The icons in the Ethiopian church in the 1300s were not as sophisticated and detailed and really used and as prevalent as we're familiar with them. And most Orthodox Christians associate iconography as really the kind of soul of what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. And most Orthodox churches are, are covered floor to ceiling with icons. The Ethiopian church wasn't necessarily that way up until the time of Emperor Zari Jacob. And so... That was one of the major things that he instituted was really pushing iconography. I think what we can go read between the lines as historians, because again, sometimes historians have to ask more questions than they have answers when we're dealing with limited source material. But there's some inferences that have to be made. So what we do know is that there were certain images that were instituted across the Ethiopian church during the reign of Emperor Zari Jacob, including some of the Virgin Mary. We both see this in the writing and the source material in Ethiopia and outside of Ethiopia. You know, the, the, the Muslim empires and Saudi Arabia and Egypt were very interested in this in Ethiopia. And sometimes a lot of the uh, history that's appropriate from a Western methodology, we do get from there. So sometimes the way you can kind of uh, cross-reference and fact-check Ethiopian oral history is to see what some of the written history are, and the region said. And they support the same kind of evolution. The archaeology, when we look at the icons, we find Ethiopia from the 1300s. Again, I don't want to use the word primitive because that's very biased, but they're very simple in their form. They are not the kind of sophisticated art that we see, you know, really peaking with the styles from Gondor in the 1700s later. So there's the evolution and the significance and development of Ethiopian religious art from the 1300s to the 1700s and developing the unique styles that we think about in Ethiopian iconography, right? It's very typically Ethiopian, is very unique, not just the actual styles of the painting, but some of the symbolic images in the painting, right? I mean, it's a very simple thing, like angels have wings. Angels don't really have wings, right? They're not birds. The wings symbolize something about their movement between divine and earth as messengers. Well, those kind of basic symbols are permeated all of Ethiopian iconography, mannerisms, gestures, 
uh, uh, the look in somebody's eye, the clothes they're wearing, which direction they're facing, how many hands are they holding up? All those things are very sophisticated and come from that history. And so really, you know, during the reign of Zadi Jacob, we see a kind of standardization and an increase in the sophistication of that. So what we find in the historical record are different charters from the emperor of funding different schools and different monasteries to produce this art. But his caveat was requiring this new sophisticated art and iconography to be put across all the churches. And so I guess what we can glean as historians is one of the controversies that the emperor caused at that time that might have upset the Stephanites was the institution of these images that may have not been widespread in their monasteries and their regions, right? And so they have some backlash against it. They feel there's some overstep because of the freedom and autonomy they had before. Now, from Zayaikov's perspective, for those no Ethiopian poly, the emperors always were heavy handed, right? And and not always for good, not always for good, but certainly always heavy handed. They were not necessarily diplomats, you know, <laughs> they didn't talk a lot, they, they acted. And so they expected their actions to be followed. When the emperor is instituting these reforms and these standardizations of Ethiopian icons, including of the Virgin Mary, his expectation is that they're going to be instituted across all the churches. At the same time, he was also putting down a culture of magic, which permeated across Ethiopia. So a lot of things that we find from this period in the archaeological record are scrolls that have these spells and incantations and, and magic stories. And it was a common practice for people to go see the priest on Sunday and the, and the magician on Monday to get the things that they wanted, right? Well, the emperor was very offended by that. And he saw it not just as a religious issue, but a political threat. Because a lot of these enchanters and diviners had some influence and, and regional influence. And so for him, they were both a threat to his sentiment as a religious leader, but also point blank a political threat to him for the influence they could have. So when he sees churches not on board with some of his changes, including icons of the Virgin Mary, his reaction is that it's a challenge to his authority and sends the wrong message to the other people who we certainly want diversity, like magicians, right? So from the emperor's perspective, um, debating about if it should be a centralized icon or not connects to the idea of, well, is there supposed to be magic in your neighborhood, right? Are you supposed to see the priest? You're supposed to see the magician. He's banning magicians with the penalty of death, right? He is literally executing magicians across the empire, making it capital punishment, which I philosophically don't agree with. But, you know, from historians, it's not our job to, to, to assert our morality on everything. We could just talk about what happened. From his perspective, capital punishment was instituted for magicians. Well, when he sees the, the Stephanite controversy uh, resisting his institution of these new icons across the empire, including in their monasteries and churches, he sees it as a different threat. And I'm not going to support his crackdown. I, I certainly think that that is a, a, a sore spot. And his own, you know, hagiography mentions his own sense of guilt and feeling like he did too much. And it's funny, it parallels a similar sentiment from the later emperor, Johannes IV, who was a similar reformer and dealt with a similar controversy we are, we're going to talk about with, with the three births and the unctionists. Um, you know, he equally was heavy handed against the Shuans, who were his rival and had different religious beliefs and regretted it, a war that he fought against them and caused a lot of, of loss of life and destruction. And his own personal reflections as a, another pious religious person, he knew he made a mistake and that he had done something not only unchristian, but unhuman. And so I think with Zadi Jacob, we saw that same self-reflection. He knew what he did in regards to implementing capital punishment for the Stephanites over a religious debate. You know, he saw that he was a little overzealous, that he saw their challenge to his authority in a church reform. You know, in his mind, it's fair. I'm killing magicians for not following our religion. What separates the Stephanites? But he was very oh, yeah. magicians, the magicians, by the way, not like David Blaine, but you have to think for the American context, if you know any Latin American communities, like especially in Cuba, but also in Mexico and parts of Brazil, you have Santeria. So really priests of Santeria. Yeah. That's a great context to mention that they were really manipulating the existing religion. In other words, they were like ultimate heretics. Yeah. And, and, and the Stephanites, I think, unfortunately, got caught up in that. Though there is some debate about how much were they just genuinely uh, iconoclasts. So I know that uh, Professor Gitachu refers to them as fundamentalists. And that's kind of the coin that I see other historians refer to them as, that they were, you know, just seeing the reforms as some kind of change, that perhaps they were against 
all icons. I don't know if we can say that's true or not, but certainly... I've in, never seen in, it in the in the evidence of their writings. I've never seen it in anything explicit. There are funny lines they have, from, for example, from the cause of the Stephanites, right? There's this uh, summation of their beliefs as follows, which seems, you know, very banal when you read it. One, worship none other than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the term worship there is very important because it's not amnuko, which is a typical word about uh, having someone be a king or reign above you, but it's the word sigd, which means to bow down or prostrate. The second one is to pursue a strict Christian morality. The third is to pursue strict observance of the ascetic life of monks. The fourth, interestingly enough, ties together the Sabbatarians because they too were Sabbatarians. It says, observe the two Sabbaths, Saturday and Sunday. And then five, I think, is where, you know, your opinion is valid in terms of the polemics of it, which is enforced rules one through four that we just said. And again, they seem non-controversial, but where I think the rubber meets the road is on the idea of imposed veneration through prostration of icons. I've never seen anywhere where they were against icons or where, you know, they were ripping icons down or, or anything like that. But what I remember is there are a number of scenes in the hagiographies where they hear and the emperor hears these rumors about Stephen. And so he calls him to his court. And it's what was typical, even in my parents' day, just a few decades ago, when Emperor Haile Selassie was there, is full-blown prostration. You know, people might bring to mind some of the images in the book of Daniel, of like what was done for Nebuchadnezzar, you know, and although that might be slightly different because it's for a, a golden image of him, um, you know, people were regularly bowing down all the way. And the Stephanites, including Father Stephen, were very adamant, were very fundamentalist in terms of refusing to do these these kind of pleasantries, which were not seen as acts of worship by the other people, but as signs of respect. And so the emperor took great disrespect, but he was very savvy and he knew he couldn't just say, oh, I'm going to put them to death like capital punishment because of this. And so he would say that by virtue of the language of only, quote unquote, worshiping the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, he probably is not going to bow to the Virgin Mary. And so Father Stephen and the Stephenites had this crafty thing, they would say, which never really answers, but maybe like you said, as historians, you could read between the lines. They said, as the shepherds and the angel found Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, and, you know, they would make sure to say these things and they would celebrate her holidays and they would do all these things. And again, they were sacramental. They were ascetic. They were monks. People made fun of them because they had different hats. Even the hats they had used to bug uh, Emperor, Emperor Zedayako, which well, he was, he was, he was a uniformist. He was trying to create a centralization. So if someone's doing something a little different, he's like, hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, of we're course, not. Hey, hey, whoa, 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 I have a sword attached. I agree. It's a heavy handed, hey, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, he said, no fedoras. Everyone's wearing yarmulkes. But, uh, you know, at, at this point, he would the emperor would call him and, and the emperor Stephen's response would be like the shepherds, like the angels, we find our lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, as we bow down before the baby Jesus, calling forth kind of the imagery of the iconography of the Madonna. And, uh, you know, it's in our tradition, it's called Mislafak Urwanda, which means with her beloved son, you know, which is one of the most, you know, common, not only in the Roman Catholic church, but in the Ethiopian church, we often put the, the Madonna, you know, we have a Virgin Mary church that, Chris and I have been a part of for years, we have the, the icon of the Madonna right above where we participate in the liturgy. So I've seen no evidence that they were out ripping down icons or taking icons down or saying icons shouldn't exist. I think the question is like, you know, today people go and they salute, they do masallam, they kiss the icon. Maybe they, they, they touch the icon with their forehead or they'll touch it with their hands and then, and then kiss it and various things like that. Versus maybe, like you're saying, a standardization of demanding everybody full on prostrate every time they see, you know, each icon. And ultimately, in, in my you know, opinion, uh, the, the emperor as well. And, and I think those things built up to the point where, you know, he whipped and lashed Father Stephen several times. 
and collected and, and put to death all, all of them, eventually all of them, you know. He became the writer of history, particularly in the book attributed as the, the miracles of Mary, the Tamara Mariam. We find a lot of this history as well as the hagiography. The fascinating tidbit I want to add here is that there's a Gundagunde monastery in the Tigray region. And recently, our mutual brother, Diakon Bazin, told me, although it's in the Tigray region, you know, the ethnopolitics today is very confusing. And people would think, oh, Tigrinya is a language. But actually, it's probably some Cushitic speakers, mostly in that language. And Professor Gatacho talks about how some of the hagiographies have some horrendous gz in terms of their grammar. And I know you appreciate the grammar of Nazi in us. And uh, so he, he would say that the Father Stephen was converting a lot of Kushites and Semites of the region. But the fascinating thing is there's continuity of this church where Professor Gatacho and a lot of people have been finding their resources and, and they're still finding some documents, still uncovering, like you said earlier, is that there's this continuity. It's not like deep archaeology in places that aren't still existing. Like that Gundagunde church is still celebrating the holidays of Father Stephen in 2020, whereas other parishes are anathematizing him and his followers. So if the Sabbatarians are an interesting example of people who could be viewed as heretics by, by Coptic leadership, but, you know, we would say for all intents and purposes are not, especially when a local council codifies their belief. And then it bleeds into the Stephanites who are also Sabbatarians and their church has always been coexisting. It, it shows one of these paradoxes or tensions in the church because they've always acknowledged the, bit, the Episcopate. You know, they, it's not like they have different liturgies there or anything, but, you know, in their synexarium, they're, they're honoring him as a saint, you know, and they're, they're still there. And that, that's the resource from which a lot of the literature of this, of this historical data is being drawn from. And that, that's just been fascinating to me that throughout this, that, that tension has been there. Full circle, would that happen to be the Deborah Bazin Monastery? Oh, no, no, it was, it was, uh, it was the, uh, uh, Bizane is a monastery in Eritrea, but yeah. uh, our brother is actually named Bazin after one of the early Ethiopian kings. They're very similar. They're, they're like homophones. But... No, I know him, but I'm saying you're talking about the monastery. I'm saying, is that the monastery he's talking about? Oh, no, no, it's the Gundagende, the Gundagende one. Got you. So that monastery, actually, the Deborah Bazin was actually chartered by Zara Jacob as a kind of consolation prize with the Sabbath controversy. And it'll come up again later because that's where the Kabat function, faction comes from as well. You know, I think just to kind of reconnect it to our bigger theme, what we do know about the Emperor Zara Jacob and what the Stephenites reflect is the, the, the back and forth as you systematize the church. So what we can say came from the reign of Zaria Yaakov. I mean, it's not coming from individually. He, there's books with his name on it, but I, I think it's romantic history to say he wrote them. It's more like the way King James' name is stamped on the King James Bible. It, it's something attributed to his time. And I'm sure with him having been a personal scholar and having been a monk priest, that he had some, some very uh, a personal interest invested in it. But it's not like he was this, this kind of Renaissance man writing everything himself, doing anything himself. Under the, his authority and guidance. Yeah. And maybe not even that, just, just, just the, the, the influence of his time. But I think that the, some of the major reforms that come out of his time and that the Stephanites are kind of a, a, a symbol of and, and, and a touchstone on is the, the more systematic use of icons. For example, every Ethiopian church has to have a picture of the Virgin Mary on the altar. That came from Zadie Jacob's reforms. We find that in his hagiography. We find that in those charters that he put on these monasteries. So the... the the historical evidence of that time are the charters of these churches and monasteries that have his name on them because they're from his time period. And the rules were that to have these churches, they had to have these images. Every church had to have the same image of the Madonna and Christ on the altar, right? Every church had to have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity icon on there, a very controversial icon for our Eastern Orthodox friends. You know, these kind of standard routines. Every church had to have a cross on, on top, right? And that was actually, I think that's where the Stephanites are important, is those are things that they were upset about. I don't know if they're full-fledged iconoclasts. I think that we can certainly assert that there was some iconoclastic flavor to them. And I, I agree with you that they were very precise in their wording. 
but I don't think we should mistake their precision as to imply that there wasn't some other things behind the wording, right? So I'm not going to say that they were iconoclasts, but I certainly think they were not cool with the standardization of the icons that Zeddy Jacob was putting in the empire. So whether they were in favor of, the, of putting the image of the Virgin Mary on the altar or not, there was some controversy in being forced to do it, I think. I think my personal interpretation is that they may not have been against all those things, but they were definitely questioning the method of, of, of it just happening, you know. So he institutes the iconographical form. He institutes really standardizing the liturgy book. He institutes, you know, we, we, we love our caduceus hymns, but, you know, they come from the 14 and 1500s, more or less, in the kind of refined form. It's under the emperor that you see the musical notation system for Yared Sim start to evolve in a historical record. Again, he didn't do any of those things personally, but those reforms come from both his long reign of 40 years and then the other, you know, 50, 100 years after of this kind of golden age in the 15th and 16th century, unfortunately cut short by the Somali invasions in 1519. Uh, but what we see is, again, that standardization. He implements the icons the way we know them, including prostrating in front of them. He institutes prostrating for the cross at the end of the liturgy like we do, where, the, where you deacons yourself come out with the cross with the priest, and we all bow down in front of it. I think it's pretty clear that we can infer from us from historians that that kind of practice is what the Stephanites were upset with. I don't know if they're right or wrong in regard or what their intention was. I think Zadi Jacob uh, uh, saw their intention as just being contrarian against them, which is why I think he overreacted to them. I don't think he dived into it in a deep theological way. I don't know if we can call them iconic class in a theological sense. They may have just been politically upset about feeling forced into these new practices when they had this previous diversity. And it could also come down to that simple, um, you know, <laughs> anybody who knows an Ethiopian abbot knows they're used to getting things their way too. So it could have been a simple personality clash between uh, a, a prestigious local religious figure who was used to getting things his way, putting heads with the emperor who's certainly more accustomed to getting things his way. But when we zoom out from a historian perspective, it's, I think we could be more interested in the actual things that happened, the reforms themselves. So the institution of iconographic reform, the funding of new schools to create better icons and styles, which are going to peak, as we talked earlier about in the 1700s in Gondor, when the imperial capital moves to there. Um, the standardization of the liturgy and expanded liturgy book and the hagiographies and the prayer books and the, the, the Psalter and the songbook, all these things, you know, that's when we start to find them in the historical record. They may have existed in forms before that, but it's no coincidence that we find so many more of them during the 14 and 1500s. And we'd find even more of them if it wasn't for what happened in the 1500s with the invasion and destruction of churches and monasteries. Paper, unfortunately, burns. The Ethiopians didn't build a lot of things with stone. The other thing is, um, you know, we find a lot of history from desert cultures, the Mediterranean. A lot of that is really uh, topographical in climate, right? I mean, the tropics don't preserve things the way the desert does. So some of the things just disappeared because, you know, they don't last that long in a tropical country as they do in a drier climate. And that was part of the appeal of the Alexandrian desert in the first place and why we find so many, you know, 2,000-year-old manuscripts there because that is preservation. But for whatever it's worth, we do find a lot more of these documents and this historical evidence in the 14, 1500s that reflect this standardization of practice. The, 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 that basically, we today in 2020 would walk into a church in, in 1520 and see things that were very familiar. Whereas if we walk into the same church in 1320, we might not feel quite as home. You know, the regional differences, the cultural differences, and the lack of a standardization may mean that we would have recognized some versus others. Whereas what Zadi Jacob's time is reflecting is this really drive for standardization. Uh, Heavy-handed, unfortunately, that's, I don't agree with his, his approach either, but certainly we can say that those things happened at that time and that we see these changes that we today can look at as historians and, and, and see that that's the origin of where a lot of these things that we do and believe came from. And again, the Stephanites then kind of just reflect the pushback to that. And the very fact that they're pushed back, you know, from a historian's perspective, that's neutral. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at the documents you mentioned, and they're hearing each person's side of that story. And seeing the debate and the discussion reveals to you what was actually happening, right? Because they're debating about what they do, 
and what they don't do, what they should and shouldn't do. Well, in their debate, we get to learn what were they doing. And I guess that's more of our interest as historians is just, well, what were they doing more so than the why part, right? The why and the how, that's for them. And that's a different kind of historical debate. I think our conversation is really more about the what and the when. And the what and the when come from that time period for sure. And it didn't get magically resolved at that time neither. You know, it's this golden age where these things get introduced, but that regional autonomy is going to continue. As you mentioned, those monasteries to this day still have that regional autonomy to do things their own way a little bit. And so we're going to see these divisions come back again in the 19th century. And as you mentioned, uh, are still with us in 2020. Um, they, they're very connected. So when we talk about, when we move forward, you know, from the standardization period of the 14 and 1500s towards, you know, the, the peak of that under Emperor Johannes IV, it, it comes down to these three regional sects, the unctionists, the adoptionists, and, you know, the Myophysites. And the, um, the unctionists actually have their origin with Awastarawals, right? And their, their documents and their, their hagiographies and their belief is that this idea of this kind of um, almost uh, Eutychianism comes from Awastarawals. They believe that he believed in unctionism, that he believed in this kind of, of subordination of the human nature of Christ into his divinity. And I don't know myself if that's true about Awastarawals or not, but that's what their you know, chain in their monasteries where these ideas come from. It's a very powerful regional belief in northern Ethiopia and parts of kind of central western Ethiopia, right? And it's going to be very different from the beliefs in central and southern Ethiopia that believe in what's called the three birth heresy or well, adoptionists in kind of orthodox heretical terms, believing that Jesus Christ became divine at a different time in his life. For me as a historian, we don't need to dive into the theology so much as it's interesting to see the variation. You know, the common theme is they consider themselves to be Orthodox Christians. But, you know, what that means is different for each of them. And so they, they, the, the diversity and belief and practice, I think, shows that the, the, the evolution of, of the church as we know it. And the, the ideas that they argue about are not always as important as just the fact that they're arguing about them, right? So what they believe affects what we do. What we do is really more important than what they believe, right? Because beliefs are going to change. The belief is the why we do something. But the, the thing that we do is what's going to remain even as the beliefs change. So why the Stephanites might have bowed down or not bowed down to an image or to a person is going to be very different than the sheer fact of doing it. You know, why I might bow down when I see the image or when I see the priest with the tablet, they might not like that. Why I do it in my personal belief doesn't change the difference of the action itself, of the prostration. And so these, these divisions have that root all the way back to what we're talking about. So I guess a good opportunity to segue into the, into the, the final evolution which comes under Emperor Johannes IV and starts with the controversial Emperor Theodore II, and which is really settling these regional divisions. So they start with the Wolstata Wolstians, right? And they start with the Solomonic Restoration, and that starts the process of centralizing the country, both politically and culturally. And then we see Emperor Zaryeka really push that home more, and we also see the pushback symbolized in the Stephanites which continue to reflect that regional autonomy and diversity. Well, it's going to kind of peak and crescendo in the 19th century with these three fully formed schools of thought, right? So by the 1900s, uh, by the 1800s, these are fully formed theological schools. Like when we talk about Alexandria and Antioch, right? There's the people who believe in the adoptionist. There's the people who believe in the unction and the people who believe in myophysitism. And they're all asserting through their leadership and hierarchy, that their belief is the orthodox dogma about Christ. But truth be told, what influences them more is the regionalism, the politics, the economics, the culture, the language, the ethnicity, right? All those layers kind of add a flavor to their belief. So that's why what they believe is important. But historians are more interested in how what they believe reflects the larger tapestry of the fabric of their lives. And, and so... I think the 1800s is really the peak and conclusion 
of this long history of reform and standardization. And anytime you're doing that, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be controversy. There's going to be people who simply don't like being asked to change. And so I think that that leads us to a great transition to the 1800s, if we can talk about those three schools with the idea of unction, adoption, and Maya physicism. Yeah, I think to just rewind a little bit, a point I made earlier was that there are these colonialists, mostly the Portuguese, who come in with the classic, you know, visage and facade of we're coming here for peaceful relations, but who have a mission. And they believe that Ethiopia is not Christian because of some of the Old Testament practices or Judaism that we, we saw or the similarities. And so they bring their, their, their Catholic church, they bring their guns, and they support in some battles overall with the Ottomans. Well, they were, they were originally invited, you know, they, they, like all colonizers, they took advantage of a situation, right? Uh, it, this, is, this is, you know, this is da Gama's son who's going into Ethiopia to do this. But he was invited by the emperor precisely to deal with the civil conflicts going on in the country. You know, let's be honest, as devil's advocates, as historians, you know, when we talk about the, 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 the Gran, um, the there's, this kind of, there's this kind of romantic idea that he was this, this like super evil dude who just ravaged churches across the country. How was he so successful across 20 years if there wasn't people kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, supporting him because of their reaction to this, you know, centralizing force? So if the Stephanites symbolize pushback against the emperor, I think the success of Ahmed Gran is the same kind of thing. It's like, sort of like, you know, since I'm talking about Johannes, he was in part given a position of power by support from the British, who thought he was a better ally for them than the other kings. Indeed, it's funny, it, 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 these things recycle and recycle. So the division that the British colonizers, who didn't colonize Ethiopia, but had an influence in what happens in Ethiopia in the 1800s, there is this wild the Nile River that we talked about earlier and in the Sudan and in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there, there, there's the, the rivalry for control of the throne after the British get involved and end up removing Emperor Theodore is over these schools, right? So you have the, the descending from the Zagwes, who is the emperor for three years, technically Georgis, right? Who is technically the emperor, according to church history, from 1861 to 1871. And then... When he dies, he's replaced with this battle between the idea of is Emperor Menelik, who comes from the three birth group in Shua in southern Ethiopia, is he going to have influence over the Myophysites from Johannes, who comes from northern area, which modern day Eritrea and northern Ethiopia? Johannes got his start by the British supporting him and giving him 6,000 cannons and some gold and things, and more or less not tipping their cap in legitimacy for him but really you know he symbolizes this same division this regional autonomy across the country who is going to have the largest say and of course the reason why there's this this bigger political division was that era of princes where the emperor was kind of a figurehead and the regional princes just vied for dominance and control of the country and the economy as a whole but um the Ethiopian back, game you know, of thrones yeah, going back to the Portuguese and the Catholics, they come in with the same idea the British did of, well, who's the person we're going to support? They came in to support what they believed to be this mythical King Prester John. They suddenly discovered that he wasn't quite as rich as the Indian kings that they thought he might be because they also at the same time are, are in, this is the Portuguese, they're also in India. And so they changed their mind and decided to try to be colonizers rather than supporters. But, you know, they have their own history. They come from the Council of Trent in the 1400s where the Vatican's trying to reunite with the Eastern Orthodox because of the rise of the Turks and the eventual fall of the Byzantine Empire. Now, this council, I think, is 1412 or 1414. We know the Byzantine Empire falls in, I think it's 1453, but that's a lifetime, 30 years. That tells you the chaos that's happening. The, the Vatican and the Latins are just trying to, like, to reunite this, re-strengthen that. They originally had good intentions. In fact, two Ethiopian delegates came to the Council of Trent and their painting, I understand, still hangs in the Vatican uh, because the Vatican sent out some diplomats from all of the Orthodox Christians 
trying to have this big council towards reunion to reconcile the great schism of, of um, 1092. But at the end of the day, as you mentioned, they came in with their own intentions and changed their mind about being helpful. They have this context of originally good intentions. And then similar to the way the Egyptians didn't send the best people, the people the Portuguese sent after the Gama are, are not the best people. In fact, I understand they uh, even sent a fake patriarch who they had pretend came from Egypt and caused no small controversy uh, pretending to be an Egyptian and pretending that the Egyptians had united with the Catholic Church and that the Ethiopians should become Catholic and be under the Pope. But they do uh, drive more reform, introduce more literature. Uh, some of our most famous icons and images in the Ethiopian church come from the Portuguese, right? Bringing these Renaissance images and bringing these images from the European tradition into Ethiopia where they were, you know, the one thing I love about Ethiopians, I forget the scholar, but he says, the Ethiopians never translate things literally. They always, you know, personalize things themselves. They're not faithful to the original. When Ethiopians got these images, they just simply love the images. You know, for example, uh, our famous image uh, of the Covenant of Mercy, that is actually a famous Renaissance portrait that is strictly forbidden in Eastern Orthodoxy because it has an image of the Father crowning the Virgin Mary with the Son. But the Ethiopians simply love the picture. I mean, point blank. The theological controversies aside had no bearing on the fact that the Ethiopian artists who saw it adored the image and made it their own and gave it an Ethiopian flavor and feel. But it's the simple devotion to the art itself that drives the, its success across the country. In my opinion, also, that's why we don't see a standardized version of Jesus in the Ethiopian church, right? So there's some controversy among some people about the ethnicity of Jesus and should his images be portrayed more historically accurate to his image, right? In other words, a uh, 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 Levantine, brown-skinned, brown-featured Jesus. Uh, the Ethiopians have that. The Ethiopians have the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus with the same devotion. And in some re uh, rural churches where people have just kind of left souvenir prayer cards and images, you'll find uh, the blonde, the brown, and the black Jesus on the same altar, right? For me as a Christian, I love the simple piety in that. The people who put those images on their altar in their church didn't see politics or, or historicity. They just saw a picture of Jesus to which they had devotion to. And, and, and so, you know, I understand the controversy in, in a white Jesus and African culture, but the Ethiopians didn't adopt it from a colonial mindset of it being forced upon them. They simply saw a picture of Jesus that they really liked. And I think it's the same with some of the things that came in during the Portuguese. Uh, they didn't have good intentions. I think one of my favorite things about Ethiopian history is the Ethiopians are never stupid. Sometimes they play it to be polite and they play really, really good chess against the Europeans. And that's one of the reasons they're never colonized is that they know how to play the game very, very well. They know how to tell the Europeans what they want to hear. They know how to show the appearance of it, but they, you know, always keep their own self in their pocket. They don't buy into the foreign model 100%. And so I think that the Ethiopians understood how to play the Portuguese against themselves. I think that they understood how to get what they wanted and what they valued from the Portuguese bringing it in. No different than later in the 1800s, Johannes and Menelik are going to play the Italians and the British and the French and the Russians against each other to get what they want to preserve the independence of their own country while the rest of the African continent falls victim to colonialism and, and, and imperialism because they didn't know how to play the game. I think what's really unique about Ethiopians, my personal opinion, is because Ethiopian polity itself is so much about gamesmanship. I mean, that's what our conversation is about when it's, when it's Stephen versus Emperor Zar Jacob. You know, you mentioned the language they're using. You mentioned what the beef's about. Well, they're playing that game with each other. These regional rivalries are playing that game with each other. Who to bow to, who not to, right? Whose name to pronounce correctly, who's not to. Those grammar Nazi things come from a real cultural framework. And yeah, so I they think never. That, they famously never called him Emperor Zarayakov. They used to call him Dibzar, which means the wolf enemy. Oh, <laughs> see, and they're playing the game. I think Ethiopians were so good at playing that political chess because they were so good at doing it themselves. That's my own personal philosophy about the success of Ethiopia as an empire and preserving its independence when so much of the world was unable to. Is they were just really good at politics because of the local politics that is gonna translate into the larger regional and uh, geopolitical politics.
being really good at dealing with your landlord, being really good at dealing with the abbot of the monastery, being really good at dealing with the duke and the prince and, and those people are going to translate into a larger skill set of dealing with the colonial threat. And so sometimes adopting things and saying the right thing is going to, you know, lead to something that's mutually beneficial. It's going to allow the Ethiopians to do their thing, their way, to adopt the images they like, to adopt the texts that they like, to adopt some of the Catholic ideas that they like. And indeed, we see after, um, you know, our, our, in the 1600s, we see that the Portuguese really sparred the Ethiopians to become more sophisticated in their own theology, in their own text. We see a definite evolution in the sophistication of the theological text in Ethiopia after the Portuguese. They pushed everybody to do better. Hi, are you trying to join the dialogue? Hey, Hi, everybody, this is Savion. His name is Fikre Selassie. <laughs> they they pushed the Portuguese by asking these clarificatory questions about the Judaizing, pushed the Emperor Gladios in the 1500s to gather the sages and to clarify these points. It pushes into the 1600s where they eventually succeed in converting to Roman Catholicism, the Emperor Susnios. And then we have another hardliner, Emperor Fasil, who brings back orthodoxy, which leads on to the later emperor, you know, Johannes, a couple centuries later that you talked about. What's interesting and why I brought up the Portuguese in this instance is in regards to the, the theological opinions, let's say, to, to be detached in our analysis of the unction, and uh, which is the, the kabat, right, and the sagga, which is the adoption, is that the Portuguese, by bringing in old debates that had been settled in 451, a thousand years later, about the Christology, about what does it mean for Jesus to be fully human, fully divine? At what point, you know, is this the eternal logos, the eternal word that is divine, that becomes the person of Jesus? Or is it when he becomes the person Jesus, when the word is mixed with the flesh from the Holy Virgin Mary? Or is it when he's baptized by John the Baptist? Is that a different person than when he's crucified? And then who's the one who comes back on the resurrection? They raise all these questions in a game theory of their own that frankly sowed the seeds of discord, right? Which is one of those things in, in the book of Proverbs that God says he abominates with his, his soul, with his breath of life. He abominates the brother who goes amongst the brethren and, and sows the seeds of discord. So they, they did these things that I think ultimately fermented and, and allowed for the local council where a lot of people don't know the name Tawahedo or Miaphysite really comes into prominence. When, when you read the various hagiographies we were talking about, about the Stephanites and about Emperor Zerayakob, you, you actually don't see the word Tawahado when they're referring no, to the church. Now, now, nowadays, we call it the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church. Back then, you see the writings and they refer to it as like the one church or the holy church or the church in Ethiopia. And so sometimes, you know, we retroject uh, anachronistically some of these, these appellations uh -huh. uh, that, that, that come about later. And it's not to say that they didn't have these Tawahado beliefs, these Miaphysite beliefs, but they didn't necessarily self-identify in that fashion because the, the need wasn't prescient until the council that you're talking about. Well, I think it comes to the heart of what we really talked about earlier. For most of our history, all that mattered was your ordination, right? At the end of the day, in fact, I have a personal theory myself that the Ethiopians didn't want autocephalus. Yes, the Egyptians had created this forgery, apparently, from Apollinarius and the Nicene Council that said the Ethiopians were not to have their own uh, jurisdiction. But let's flip it. What benefit do the Ethiopians have by having this more or less neutral figure who's not Ethiopian that defines legitimacy that translates to political legitimacy? If the Ethiopians have their own internal conflict about who's in charge of what part of the country or what part of the city or whatever it might be, having this kind of neutral arbitrator, well, this is the, this is the metropolitan, you know what I mean? It, it's an advantage politically to have that be the sign of your legitimacy. It comes from you being orthodox because you're the one who's in line with the Egyptian metropolitan who comes down. Even though, for example, you know, we're, since we're talking about this heresy, 
that's where one of them come from. Deborah Lomano's monastery is where the, you know, the real head of the Ethiopian church is. And that's where Kibat comes from, right? I mean, I'm sorry, that's where Sosledet comes from. So interestingly, the, the real head of the Ethiopian church was also the head of the adoptionist heresy. But it wasn't as big of a deal because what was more important was the secession than the theology. I think that's true about Orthodox history as a whole and in general, you know. Today, we define it that way because the question is asked, and as you mentioned, it was spurred by the Catholics at that time, too, because they were Jesuits, and Jesuits' whole mission was to put down heresy. That's their whole game, right? Their whole tradition is to be these warrior priests who go around the world fighting uh, originally European Protestantism and European heresies, but by default spread it through imperialism to other parts of the world, too. Um, I guess maybe the Jesuits are a retaliation to the failure of the Council of Trent, right? Since the Orthodox don't want to get together, now that Islam replaced the Byzantine Empire, now that Protestantism is rising in Europe, we're going to be as heavy-handed as Zer Jacob felt he had to be. We were playing nice the first time when we talked about it, and y'all kept doing your own thing. So the Jesuits are, are, are not positive figures in world history. They have this very nefarious agenda to divide, to conquer, because they believe um, that they're the kind of Puritan truth they also, by default, push people to redefine their own beliefs. So as you mentioned, the Ethiopian scholars had to really get together and, and you know, cross their T's and dot their I's to have these theological debates. Uh, originally, the Ethiopian emperor who converted Catholicism was swayed because of how sophisticated in Gez the Portuguese were, right? They're the ones who put together the first um, European dictionaries in Gez. You know, they had uh, schools in the Vatican teaching Ethiopian languages so they could come and present themselves being so smart and sophisticated. And it pushed the Ethiopians to have to up their game, too, in response to it. And they did. And, and they successfully pushed the Catholics out and left with, a, again, more reformed, more sophisticated church. But those regional divisions remain because the ultimate geography in a large part that gave it that, right? Ethiopia is, is this mountainous place. It's divided. Look at the topographic map of Ethiopia. It's just mountains and rivers. It's the whole country. And, and even today in 2020, during the rainy season, there's parts of the country you simply can't travel with all the modern technology and modern transportation in the world, right? So some of the autonomy we see in Ethiopia is a, is a result and product of geography itself and topography. But regardless of, of its cause, there is these, these different ideas. By the 1800s, they become so much more sophisticated themselves. They've had their own internal debates and discussions. They've written their books. They've had their scholars get to it. They've crossed their T's, dotted their I's, and now they have their fully formed ideas of adoptionism, unctionism, and the orthodox idea of twihadomyophysitism. And I think full circle that brings us to the real heart of our discussion, which is not just the evolution of the practices of the church, but why are things the way they are today? So to bring it together, why do we have Saturday worship and a, a Old Testament flavor to the Ethiopian church and culture, right? So we don't have to be religious. This doesn't have to be for the believers, me and you are believers. But for just people who are curious about Ethiopian history and culture, this Old Testament feel and flavor comes from the Solomonic Restoration, comes from uh, Wastar Wolves in that time period. Then it's golden age under the emperor we see of uh, Zar Jacob, we see this and this drive towards systematizing things, towards making them more sophisticated, towards making them more concerted and choreographed together. And so the, a lot of things we're familiar with, the calendar, the holidays, the books, the songs, the images, the, the architecture, the wardrobe, all of these things come from that time. They become so much more sophisticated. But, you know, when the Portuguese arrive in the 1500s and we read their, their narratives, they describe a church that looks like the one we have. I actually have an anecdotal story. There's uh, an engraving um, in, uh, I believe his name is Alameda, uh, one of the Portuguese priests who came on that expedition with the Gama. And he drew a picture of an Ethiopian priest distributing Holy Communion. And <laughs> the very posture and mannerisms of the priest, the way his body is, the way his facial expression is, the way his hand is, looks like the way a priest today very specifically kind of gesticulates as they produce it. So when I see this picture, it looks like Abba Laika in our church passing a Holy Communion because Abba Laika does these things not, you know, from his own way. It was what he was taught in his tradition, in his monastery. And those very things, you know, come from that time period. Well, now full circle in the 1800s, 
those regional differences have become just as sophisticated. So the adoptionists who believe that Jesus Christ became God at his baptism, they have become very sophisticated in their theology to explain this. They have a whole school of thought. And they believe that that's the orthodox idea. And they've adopted the other things we're talking about. They got the same songbook. They got the same prayer book. They got the same icons. Their priests wear the same dress. They do the same things. But now the why is becoming more important. We fleshed out the what and the when. But now we're diving into the heart of the how and the why. And that's where we're going to get to the ultimate um, unification of the Ethiopian church. It's, I, I think it's a very much intentional play on words to call the church Twahedo, made into one, because not only does it talk about the theology of the Mayaphysite union of Christ, but in the kind of wax and gold poetry of the Ethiopian tradition, it talks about trying to reunify this very divided country and church, both culturally and politically. It's no coincidence that the most centralized time in Ethiopian politics under Burhali Selassie don't just come because of modern technology that make that more possible, but the cultural technology and the idea of bringing everybody together as one. Unfortunately, it's, it's caused the romanticism and revision of the history. Now that those things became part of the Heli Selassie time, people kind of try to, as you use, anachronize them to the past and assume that, well, that's the way it always was. It's not the way it always was, but it reaches its peak in that time. And the 1800s really is like, okay, like I said, now we're at the why. We got all the what taken care of. We figured out all the nuts and bolts of what it means to be an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian. What do we do as Christians? Now, we're really talking about the why. And the why is Jesus. Well, who is Jesus and what does it mean to be him? And the Orthodox Church itself has its history in our Oriental Church about this debate. At, at, I always pronounced it wrong, Chalcedon, and no one corrected me until I saw what people calling it Chalcedon. And I'm going to roll with that. You know, that division of the nature of Christ, what does it mean to be God and man at the same time? That's the why we're Christians. Why would we have icons in the church? Why would we even go to church? What's the point of a priest? And if we should bow to him or not and kiss his cross or not to the heart and soul of it being a representative of Jesus Christ? Well, who is Jesus? So we have those three schools of thought. And by the 1800s, they're very sophisticated. They're very fully formed. And the adoptionists believe that Jesus Christ becomes God at his baptism. And that's not a new heresy at all. It is a belief that goes all the way back to the 400. But nonetheless, it is one that Orthodox Christianity across this time has asserted is not correct because it doesn't add up theologically. It, 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 it doesn't explain how Jesus can be God and man at the same time. It presents a new paradox and a new problem. Likewise, the, the, uh, the, the unction is the same thing. It, it, it's, it's become, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I'm mixing up my heresies. My heresies get you confused. The unction is. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Uh, we, we've, we've at least named them. So we, we know which devils we're, we're talking about. And, and for me, those same texts that, that you mentioned that are in common are where I think, you know, our salvation is. As we said, there are ongoing controversies in 2020 of this stuff that we're talking about that begins, you know, centuries ago. But the way that it's persisted is kind of like the Santeria priests or the magicians that Chris was talking about earlier. And that's because a lot of this has been hush-hush. It's not like they're out there printing, here's an unction book, here's an adoption book, and they're passing these books out and selling it publicly in a bookstore. It's not like they have an official building where they meet up, you know, and they say, hey, you go to our website and check it out. And here's our Facebook invite for the event. A lot of this stuff is hush-hush, it's behind closed doors. And sometimes at some of the major uh, monasteries on the Gonda Tigray border, you have Waliba, Dorivanos, and Shoa. You have some of these people who just say, you know what, let's agree to disagree. And they celebrate the liturgy at different times. So, as you said, they got the same garb and they kind of have this agree to disagree mentality and they just don't link up together. But they're not appealing to the Copts, to the Syriac, to the Armenians, and to the, the Malanka or the Indians to try to gather together and say, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's figure this all out as one communion. They just kind of keep it to themselves and they keep it hush hush. And I think there's an acknowledgement of, like you said, the, the actual books that we have are, are different from that. So 
I, I think the salvation, the rescue, the deliverance we have from this stuff is just focusing on what I try to do with my Tawahedo Bible study, which is like the scriptural interpretation from the School of Aksum, as well as the Juridian hymns or the, the hymns of Kondusiaret of St. Jared or Holy Jared of Aksum. And I think the, the wisdom found in there is going to comport with the Miaphysite Christology or the Tawahedo. And it's, it's not going to have any unction or uh, adoption beliefs. So... Those are kind of my my closing thoughts. Did, did you have any other closing thoughts, Chris? So let me put it together. The unctionist and the adoptionist is a different idea. The unctionists are, are unionists in a sense of believing in a, in a kind of eutychianism, that the natures are fully united. The adoptionists believe that Christ takes on a divine nature later. They can, you know, uh, push comes to shove. They could sound like Fuajero, because they still acknowledge the union, but their debate is when did the union happen? Whereas exactly. the young is, you know, they believe in a kind of Eutychianism in, in a union that's not orthodox. To bring it more historically, again, we mentioned it's regional. The young has come from one part of Ethiopia and they're very entrenched there. The, the, the uh, adoptionists come from the, the southern eastern part of Ethiopia and they're very entrenched there as well. And I think that's probably the explanation as to why that's still happening today in 2020, because the very influence that created those divisions and those differences is still gonna be there, right? If it's regional, if it's cultural, if it's historical. So it's not just because they're attached to the theological idea, it's more like the thought, theological idea comes from the product of that history and that culture and that region. And of course, Ethiopians are very proud of their regional history, right? People are attached to where they come from. Uh, even the very idea of being modern Ethiopian is modern, right? You know, being Habesha connected to this larger country of Ethiopia is very modern compared to what it was in the time we're talking about in the 1800s, let alone the 1400s. It's, it's artificial. Probably, it's younger yeah. than me. It it's, came it, around it, in 91. And nationalism is a modern thing. It comes out of the 1870s and 80s. It's no coincidence the Italians want to create an empire in Ethiopia because they barely created an Italy in Italy in 1871, right? Before that, they were a bunch of rival states and regions. And being from Florence was more important than being from Venice or vice versa. So being from Gojum or being from Shoah or being from Tigray is going to have that same influence in Ethiopia as it might in Germany in the Holy Roman Empire or in Italy. So... You know, those ideas come from that context, that history, that regionalism. I think the diversity really reflects what's beautiful about Ethiopia history, Ethiopian history as a whole, which is this regional autonomy, this regional flair to do things your own way. And I think the, the, the concluding thought to connect all these dots we've talked about in our kind of widespread discussion is this, this, this centripetal force, right? Bringing things together. There's always centrifugal forces pushing things away. But the driving history of Ethiopia is people coming more and more together, unifying their ideas, unifying their beliefs, their practices, their cultures, their languages. It's a very diverse place with so many different languages and ethnicities and histories. But the common theme of 2,000 years of more or less modern Ethiopian history is coming together towards this modern idea of being today Ethiopian, whereas before it was Habesha, which was more of an ethnic term that actually was put out by the Arabs to describe a kind of generic people from a certain part of the world. But that same, you know, the gift is a double-edged sword. The regional autonomy that creates this beautiful diversity, even as it comes together, is going to kind of sometimes push it apart. But ultimately, people, in my opinion, come together more than they don't. I think that's my, my personal view of history. I have a progressive and linear view of history that, that people are always more or less coming together and building on things together. I think it's within our human nature to do that. Uh, I think that that's one of the things that makes us uniquely human and how we evolved from something no different than the other animals out there that have their own culture to being the most important animal on the planet because we really, as a social mammal, put things together very differently than other animals have done. And so to bring it full circle, I got my baby out there too, so we can finish this up within the last five minutes, put it all together. You know, we see Emperor Johannes the Fourth trying to finally settle all this. I think he personally thought of himself as being a figure like Emperor Zarya I wouldn't be surprised if in his personal life he felt a kind of affinity towards that. 
Uh, I think Zar Yaakov has also been sainted, though, in our church. We don't have a very central way to do that. As you mentioned, those monasteries calling the Stephanite leaders saints, and they're certainly not in the larger tradition. I imagine in my own personal view that Emperor Johannes, I won't be surprised if we find that um, in his own records of sorts, had a kind of connection in his eye, in his own self with Emperor Zar Yaakov and felt that he was going to be this unifier, that he was going to be this uh, not quite zealot, but really, like, uh, 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 um, I just think he felt he was some kind of savior of sorts. He was going to bring this orthodoxy back. He's going to bring everybody together. He's going to bring the band back together. Everything's going to be good. We're going to put together these divisions. And I think what he understood in the 1800s was that the divisions had become about the why, not the what. In history, you know, with the Sabbatarians, it was the what. Are we worshiping on Saturday or are we not? With, you know, with the Stephanites. Are we going to bow down to these images in the cross or aren't we? Are we going to accept the authority of the emperor in the church or aren't we, right? And that's a history even in Eastern church too. What's the, what is the role of the emperor in the church? Should he have a say or shouldn't he? I think that's something that is important to know about the Stephanites. Perhaps their beef was more so the overstep of the emperor in the church. Well, I think Emperor uh, Johannes IV sees this opportunity to say, now that we've got the what done, we do things the same way, let's really flesh out the how and the why, and hopefully that will bring people together. As you mentioned, it's happening today, so there might be some naivete, but hopefully in the future we continue to get in this direction of bringing things together. So at the Council of Borumera, he brings it together. He brings the representatives of the different schools, and, and they have their discussion, and they flesh out and define what is an orthodox doctrine, and then that's where we get the term tuajero. And as I mentioned, I do believe it's a play on words to also bring the church together as one to bring the country together as one, to bring this diversity of people as one. You know, for the Ethiopians listening to this, they know the ethnic the divisions, the distinctions between Northern and Eastern and Western and Southern Ethiopia. And they play no small part in these theological controversies and these divisions over praxis, right? So what sounds like a, you know, debate about what's going on in this church and this part of the country really touches on these other divisions and history and ethnic things. So I really think the emperor's goal was to bring it all together to say, you know, let's squash all the beefs. We know how long they are. We know about the blood feuds. We know who killed somebody's great, 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 great grandpa. And we feel you on that. But, you know, let's come together as Christians. If we're a Christian empire and a Christian church, then we should be able to put aside and forgive the grievances and grudges of the past. But we also need to get together our ideas because I think what he also understood wasn't allowing in this plurality of regional ideas would also allow for the regional plurality in practice, which is going to then get people divided and it was going to not allow for a union as a country. Uh, and, and so I think his goal is to just finally hash out the why. They have the council, they develop a version of Tuajaro that is very friendly to the, the uh, uh, three births, right? The three births people, the Sos Ledet, the, the, the Segalej, the Son of Grace people, they can accept Tuajero. You know what I mean? It's written in a way in which they're not entirely against. Their whole philosophy is that Christ took on this divine nature. He's a man who became God at his baptism. Now, we know when we talk with larger orthodoxy that that's a heresy. But what they agree with is the union, that it's a perfect Maya union. It's the unctionists who believe in something similar to Eutychianism that the humanity is subordinate to the divine, and even that to a degree the son is subordinate to the father. They don't quite have an equality in the, in the Trinity as is orthodox. So I feel like what Johannes is doing is he's offering this olive branch to his rival in Menelik and the Shoans, and also Deborah Lebanos, which is the most prestigious monastery where most of the leadership of the church comes from, to say, Here's a version of Orthodox Christianity that will make everybody happy. It's going to make the Alexandrians who are in charge of us happy. It's going to connect us with the other Oriental Orthodox of the world and bring us into that thing. It's going to really make our theology sophisticated and, and well thought out. And there's a little bit of wiggle room for you, too. Now, push comes to shove, you guys are wrong because that doesn't make sense. But we're going to let you guys figure that out as long as you agree to this doctrine. And for the people that believed in Kabat, well, hey, it sucks for you guys, but we can't fix that. There's no wiggle room in, in your subordination and unction belief, right? You're, you're not 
you're not, a, you're not, there's no way we can make that orthodox. So unfortunately they had to go. Now they also come from a region that is, is close to where Johannes comes from. His, you know, the, originally the emperors are coming from a different part of Ethiopia. Part of the controversy of Johannes is coming from Northern Ethiopia and shifting towards this kind of more Aksumite area where the Solomonic emperors before him didn't come from that part of Ethiopia. So I think that he's like, hey, I can take care of the Kabat folks. They're my neighbors. We got this. My beef and my history is the issue I have with Menelik and the Shoans and Deborah Labanos. I need them on my side to get what I'm trying to do, to unite the country and to protect us from the Europeans who are knocking on the door trying to take over our country as well. So they all come together. They flesh out a declaration of faith that we call Tuahero that, you know, the majority of Ethiopian Christians are able to accept. I think that's the culmination of our whole discussion. Now we see a unification in practice and belief. And it's a, it's a model across this history that allows everybody to feel that there was some of their voice and to feel that the practices reflect their own cultures and their own regions and their own histories. So I think that the emperor was trying to have the best of all worlds in that particular case. Certainly the, the Kabat fact who, who were not accepted are going to have something to say about it, but I think they didn't have as much influence and were not as large as were the Sosledet who end up accepting the Ethiopian Orthodox Tuahoro Church as the official title. That, of course, leads us towards autocephalacy, separating from the Egyptians, doing our own thing, and now really being the modern church and modern country that we have today. And while we are now back into an ancient division about the water of the Nile, we, uh, part of that is because the Ethiopians are coming from a position of strength, coming from having put all these dots together and all this history together to create this modern country, this modern culture, and this modern identity that is built on all these puzzle pieces that we've been discussing. And that is their strength that makes them unique. Um, you know, not to put down other countries and cultures in Africa, but that's something that makes Ethiopia unique in African history as well, to really keep it together for such a long period of time and use that as a position of strength to be able to resist outside forces trying to break it apart. And to have this model and framework to keep inside divisions under control too, right? By unifying things and explaining it well, uh, it allows internal divisions and external threats to both be mitigated at the same time. And I think that, that, that the Council of Bodomeda in 1878 is really the high watermark of the Ethiopian church. And it's the answer to the question of why do we do things the way we do today and where they come from. They came from this, 1300, this 700 years of history we've been discussing from 1300 to today. But they, in that, absorb and reflect all of this diversity, all of this culture, all of this history that we've been discussing. And for me, uh, from a historian's perspective, it's just beautiful on its own. You know, we can sit here and wax poetic about all these things, not because of what they're connected to, because they're so beautiful as their own gems on the crown. So it's been a beautiful discussion and conversation. And uh, we always have these beautiful discussions. So I'm glad that we can invite people into ours to hear the conversations we have. I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not always the best expert at the notes that I share. And if there's anybody that have some more details to help us on this, please add me at Chris Hapti or talk to my brother Deacon Hanok and let us know and let's continue this dialogue and discussion that we can add to our notebook and really continue to talk about this beautiful history.